Bible tells us in the book of Acts chapter 1 that Jesus had given them a mandate. He says, I want you to wait until you be endued with power of on high. Wait for the commandment that I give you. And the Bible said that they waited and they went one accord. But the thing is that when they started in the book of Acts chapter 1, they started with 500, but when they finished, they had 120. So it's not everybody that waited for what Jesus told them that they needed to do. He said, he said, it's not, I'm not going to tell you to wait for what, it, for what I have if you feel like it or if you think you need it. But I'm telling you, he said, you need it. And he was speaking about the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah. He said that to stay there until you be endued from power upon high. We need power upon high in our lives today. Yeah. He said that you shall receive a, a power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And power for what? To be a witness to Christ. The Bible said that when they were in one court, that means they were all together, yeah. unanimously. They were together with the same passion for Christ. They were all together that day. The waiting for the breath of God, the very life of God, to breathe in them and upon their lives. They were together in one heart, in one mind, in one accord for what Jesus had told them that they needed to have. And the Bible said that on the day of Pentecost, that the fire, that, that, that as they were sitting in one place in one accord again, that as, they came as a mighty rushing wind and fire, as, as a clothes of tongues of fire sat upon each one of them, and all were filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, all were filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, he said, you're going to receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. See, power for what? Power to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Power to be able to live for God. Power to be able to know truth. Power to overcome situations in your life. You will receive the power of God's Spirit to be an overcomer, to be able to live for Christ in the day we live in Him. You see, nothing has changed in this world except it's gotten worse and worse and worse. You see, the Bible said from the beginning of time until now, Every one of us has sat one in one place or another. Every one of us heard in one place or another the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the beginning of time, God has preached the word to people. That's the right. beginning of time, he's tried to reach people's hearts and lives where the redemption of uh, power of Christ has come to redeem us from destruction, to redeem us from sin, to redeem us from hell in our life. And are we going to hear what thus saith the Lord is saying to the church today? You see the book of Jude right here. The Bible says that in the book of Jude, he was writing to the church. He identified them right here as to the church. And the beginning, and then when you study this out, they said that this particular message was written to the church in the first century. It's amazing how we in the year of 2015 of the church today that hear the same message that they heard in their day. You see, what is he saying to you and I today? The Bible speaks in the book of Jude. He identifies this, this uh, particular passage in this, this letter to the church, to the Christian. In this thing, it has purpose. The purpose is that we have to understand why he is writing this to you and I in the book of Jude. How can we relate this passage of Scripture to our lives today? You see, the Bible says in the book of Jude, uh, uh, chapter 1 through 4, he tells us right here, how can the church identify with what he's saying right there? And then he speaks about warning people of the days that they're living in. Warning them of what they can look for, what they can recognize. You know, how can they relate to this word, to what we live in today? And then he says in verse 20, I want us to go there for the reading of the word. Because when you come back to these scriptures, two chapter, it's only one chapter, verse 20. You know, he speaks about all this here in, the, in these scriptures, 1 through verse 19, but he yes, said, But ye, beloved, yep. who are the beloved, you and I? But yes, ye, beloved, this is what you do. Oh, Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, Ooh. praying Ooh. in the Holy Ghost. Ooh. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ Amen. unto eternal life. Oh, and of some or on some, have compassion, making a difference. And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, heading even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, 
in glory and majesty, Brent. dominion, Brent. power, both now and forever. No. He tells us what we have to do and these days that he's speaking about right here. He says right here in the verses 1 through 4, it says, Jew, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother James, to them that are sanctified by God. Are you sanctified by God today? Are, is your life set apart for God today? He said, he's writing to the church, that those who are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, our mutual salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you. Say it's needful. Evil. To write unto you and to exhort you or to urge you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And first of all, I want you to know I'm writing this letter to the church. I'm writing to those who are saved. Are you saved today? Yeah, come on, he said, I'm writing to those who are saved. I'm yeah. writing to those who are sanctified. To be sanctified is that you set your life apart from everything. You set yourself apart, your life, your heart, unto serving the Lord. You make up your mind. You might not be where you need to be today, but you might be on your way to getting there. So if you're in that place, he's talking to you today. He said he's talking to the church here. Those who are sanctified in Christ, those who live in the love of God and protection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you living in the love of God today? Are you living in the protection of Jesus Christ today? He said, because when, when you're living in the love of God and the protection of Jesus Christ, you've got to know something. There is none greater. There is none more powerful. There is none more, you know, more powerful than he is. He said, and because of that, he speaks in this word here that plainly has been stated before. And he said, it's the purpose of this is to know that you can live. He said, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. He said, I just don't want you to experience the love of God or the mercy of God or the peace of God in your life. But I want you to experience it to the full measure. He said, if you are the Christian today that's living in the love of God, and the protection of Jesus Christ be speaking to you and I today. What does it mean to live in the love of God? It means that I know that he loved me when I was unlovable. Right. He loved me yeah. because, yeah. But because yeah. I had experienced his love. He loved me, not because of what I did, but because of who he is. He loved me and he picked me up because I was in sin going to hell. And he picked me up in his love and cleansed me in his precious blood. And I live in the protection of Christ Jesus today. I live in the power of the blood of Christ today. Are you living there today? Our only protection in life is in Christ Jesus. You say he's talking to the church today. Are you living in that place where Christ has healed your body, has given you peace of mind, has delivered you from the hand of the devil? Are we living in that place today? He said, this is what he's talking about today. Identify yourself, he said, with Christ. Identify yourself with God. Identify yourself with the power of God. Hallelujah. He said, because when you do that, he said, you got to know some stuff. He said, the purpose of this is to let you know some things. Now that you know who you are, now that you have experienced his power, his grace, his mercy, all that he is for you in your life, and you proclaim Christ, and you live for him, then you've got to know some things. He said, I, he said, the purpose of this now is to warn you about certain things. He said, I need to warn you about some things. He said, this is needful for you. He said, he's talking about our salvation. Are we saved today? Yes. Do we have a mutual salvation? Have we all come to the same, and come the same way, God got to, to, the, to the Lord the same way through the cross of Calvary? Right. He said, I'm talking to you today because this is needful for you. You need to know about it. You need to hear about it. You need to think about it. You need to meditate upon it because the days are evil that we live in. He said, you got to know some things. He said, your faith, I urge you. He said, it's an urgency. Yet urgency is, man, you better not mess up and lose time. 
You better deal with it right now. Yeah. An yeah. urgent thing. Yeah. He said, it's thankful for you to know that right now, that there are some things that we're going to have to do concerning our salvation. Mm -hmm. He's talking about contending for your faith. He's talking about your faith. He's not just talking about just any faith. He's talking about summing it all up, all summed up in one thing, your belief, your Christian belief, your Christian faith. Where you base your faith is where you base your life. Where your faith is, is where your life is. And he said, you need to know these things. He said, because there's coming a time, he said, that we're going to have to contend or fight for our faith. You're going to have to contend, not just fight for your faith, he said, but you're going to have to do battle for your faith. Are we living in those days today? When it was written in the first century years ago, and it's written to you and I today, what will we do with what Jesus has given to you and I today? Are we willing to fight for our faith? Are you willing to contend for your faith? Are you willing to recognize the fact that we're living in this day right here? He says right here, I encourage you and urge you. It's needful that we contend for the faith. I don't know about you, but I made up my mind a long time ago when I got saved. In 1981, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Knew nothing about salvation. Didn't know nothing about being born again. I knew about religion, but I didn't know about salvation about a personal relationship with the Lord. But I made my mind the night that I got saved. Whatever it took in my life, whatever I needed to do to learn about Him, to draw close to Him, to follow Him, I was willing to do it. Let me tell you, when you get saved, that's the time you start to contend for your faith. Because the devil wants to make sure that he can stray you away from your faith in God. He will put all kinds of obstacles your way. You see, but you've got to make up your mind. Whatever it takes, you are going to do battle for your faith. Hallelujah. Oh, like he's talking about right here. Oh, let me tell you another thing about Jesus. When you follow him, he will never let you down. He will never let you down. You might think he let you down. But those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like a eagle. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall, be, they, shall, uh, uh, they shall run and not be weary. Walk and not pain. Because of the Lord that carries you, empowers you, strengthens you to live for him. He said, these are the things that you have to know. He said, it's needful and it's an urgency. He said, because there's purpose for what he's talking about right here. He says right here, uh, there's a warning to the church today, he said, because it's concerning the grace. He said there's false teachers, people that claim to be a believer, that's, has that crept in unnoticed, unaware. And they're in the church and filtering the church today. And they don't have no, no concern about the grace of God, but they want to use the grace as an avenue to say they can sin more. The Bible said, if God has given us grace, grace is his works. Had nothing to do with you and I. Had everything to do with Jesus Christ. And what he did for you and I. And the grace of God. He said they would take it in verse 4 and turn it into lasciviousness. What did that mean? They would distort the grace of God. By lasciviousness. That means uh, it has something to do with sex in a bad and a wrong way. Mm -hmm. I think we can see that all around us today. Yeah. That's the first thing he said you can notice right here. When they, that when the church has been infiltrated with this stuff, mm -hmm. he said that they took the grace, the grace that God gave to you and I, and turned it into what? Something that would appeal to them and what they wanted, mm -hmm. how they wanted, yeah. not how God said. Mm -hmm. So he said that's the first thing you better you better be aware of. He said, you need to have a revelation of this. A revelation of this word is to, that when the word has been uncovered in your heart, a revelation of his word is when uh, uh, the word has been quickened and made alive inside of you. Jesus said, his words are life, their spirit and their life. And they help to all our flesh. 
He said his word will quicken and make things alive within our heart and soul when we hear it. He said the flesh profits nothing. It's the spirit of God that quickens and makes alive, gives us revelation of God's word for our heart and life. Hallelujah. He said, I want you to know. He said, when he began to speak to them in this chapter right here, he began to tell them about to remember what we, what we learned in the word. He said, this word was preached to everybody. He said, they heard it preached like you and I hear it preached today. But some of them followed the Lord and some of them didn't. But he said, I want you to remember to encourage you, to strengthen you, to empower you to serve the Lord because there's an end to everything. He said, remember in the scriptures here, he said about those that said or say they're righteous and don't live a life. Beware of those people, he said. Because you see, it's not just saying something with your mouth, but it's what you do with your life. That's what makes you Christian. You know, we can talk all we want. We can talk the talk, but then we walk the walk. That's what he's saying here in the Word. Don't be, uh, uh, you know, a Christian that just talks it out of your mouth, but don't live it in your heart and life. He said, remember those that God took out of Egypt. He said, you know, a lot of them wanted to talk the talk, but they didn't want to live the life. He said, remember what happened? He rescued them out of slavery. Right. He rescued them out of bondage to give them a new life. What Christ has done for you and I, he rescued you and I out of sin, out of forgiveness, a new life. Hallelujah. He said, remember they're in. He said, remember about Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, and the towns that were surrounded. What was going on in that day? He said, this is the warning to the church, he said. This is something that you have to know, and it's got purpose. It's not just to, to, to uh, take pages in the book and write more says to take a place. It's the reality of where we live in today. Oh, yeah. He says right here at Sodom and Gomorrah, what was going on there? The Bible said that God said that there, there was corruption. There was wickedness. Continually, their behavior was corrupt and wicked. They were unnatural and impure. What do we see around us today? Yes. It doesn't take, we don't have to look into anything deep today. All we do is take a look and see all of this happening in our lifetime. Yes. He said this is a warning to the church to beware of these things when you see these things happen. Yes. Jesus said that they could understand if it was going to rain, if it's cloudy out there, or if the wind is blowing and there's going to storm brewing. You can recognize all these things on the outside. But he said, you cannot discern the signs of the time. He's talking about in the word here, the book of Jude, about the end of the age, or in the last time, or in the last days, we can see these things come to happen. He didn't put this in the word to, to, to bring fear in parts of someone's heart. He put this here that we can be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove, that we can recognize you know, the challenges are great that we live in today, but our God is greater than anything that we face in this life. I see those in the Word that stood up for their faith. They fought for their faith. They continued the faith that they had in the living, risen God, and God was right there with them. He's not looking for codes. He's looking for people that will believe what His Word has said and strengthen them by His Spirit. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost, Jesus said, you will receive power. Power to witness for Christ. Power to live for Christ. Power to know Jesus. Power. He said His word is light. It gives you light so you can see your way. So you can know your way. He gives you truth so you can be free. To know the truth, the truth shall make you free. He gives you help to know that whatever you go in, He is a helper of those who call upon His name. He gives you hope to know that you're not in this life alone. He has given you and I everything that we need yes. to live this life as a Christian in this life. He said, beware of all these things he told them in the book of Jude. He said, there's some of them that despise authority. I mean, I've never seen anything like in my life that people have no respect for authority today. They despise authority. They make their own rules. They do their own thing. 
no fear of God, no fear of authority, no fear of nothing. It seems like we're living in the day right here when this was written. Can we recognize that in our life? He says right here that remember the angels who were rebellious. They left their first estate. They left their home. And when they left their home, they fell out of the authority and protection of God. And now they're in everlasting change forever, waiting for the day of judgment and condemnation. He said, think about those things. Think about what the Word is saying to you and I today. He says right here, and some of them know to do better, but they don't do, they don't do better. They do stuff anyway that will destroy them in the end. And there'll be a day that people will be living like wild animals. We see that not long ago when they had some park in New York that, that the young people went there and God helped them with the stuff that they were doing out in the open. I mean, we can, we can relate to this right here in the day we're living in today. But he says, walk unto those who follow the way of Cain. Woe to those who follow the way of Cain. What was the way of Cain? The way of Cain is so that he could make himself righteous with God. God is, he, he's made the way, you and I. The only way to be righteous with God is through Jesus. His blood, his son. There is no other way to heaven. There is no other way to truth. There is no other way but through Jesus Christ. So if you try to get there by your works, or by a religion, God help you, and God will show you the truth. You see, he said, one to those that go the way of pain. Try to make himself righteous in his own works. He said, one to those that follow that spirit of Balaam. What was that? He was deceived and he was covetous. He wanted stuff. He wanted to, they had hired him to curse God's people. And finally he realized what God has blessed, no one can curse. Right. Let me tell you something, my friend. We are lost in the blood of the Lord. We have the Holy Ghost. We are the blessed of the redeemed. And we are the redeemed of the Lord. And we say so. And what God has given to you and I in our life, no one can curse what God has blessed. The devil is a liar. Hallelujah. He said, woe unto Korah. What was Korah like? He said, woe unto those who act like Korah. He had a big mouth, a loud mouth, always starting trouble, always starting division, causing problems, always fighting against everything Moses did. And the Bible said God had enough. He had enough. Because you see, it's very dangerous to rebel against the designated authority that God has placed in this earth. Right. Whether we think they're right or wrong. And he mouthed off. And one day God said, I had enough. So God took his earth and he found that he got the mouth of the earth. And the Bible said the mouth opened up this earth and swallowed them all up. Yeah. Took care of that. He said, be careful because he said it's a spirit of rebellion. And that's a spirit of rebellion in the land throughout the earth today. Rebelling about everything. You see, the Bible tells us about rebellion. It says, first of all, the rebellious dwell in a dry land. I say that a long time ago in the Word. Because you see, and none of us were born with a spirit of humility. Every one of us were born with a spirit of rebellion. Right. Rebellion says, I want to do it my way. I know better than you. I'm smarter than you. I know more than you. So I'm going to do it my way. That's rebellion. He said, the rebellious dwell in the dry land. And I read that one there and said, Lord, I don't want to dry. I don't want no more dry land than what I'm in now. Whatever it takes for me to do what I need to do, I just ask you to help me, to forgive me, and, and teach me how to be humble in your sight. The Bible said the rebellious. The rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. It opens the door for the devil. So we understand all these things. He said, this is a warning for the church. He said, those that practice that, you know, will be destroyed in the end. So God tells us 
stay away from these things. Recognize the fact that these things are here. And he said, I wish, and about those that are, their lives, they act like they're godly, and their lives, they're really an ungodly person, a, a, a fake, a phony, a pretender of being a Christian. He said, I'm going to tell you what their lives are like. He said, they're like clouds with no rain. Well, what would this world be like if God had a crowd and it never held the rain? The cloud would just, just, just hover over with heat, and you just look at it, but it had no purpose. He said, that's how they are. They're like a cloud with no rain. No spirit, no watering of God's spirit. He said, they're like trees that don't have no fruit. And they're, how would you like to have a fruit tree that never had fruit? That's how they are. He said they also are like a dead tree that's been dead twice. And the only purpose of that is to put them in the fire and burn them up. 